when you're dealing with the supernatural and you're dealing with that which is eternal, it's quite different from dealing with a, a subject that uh, is related to natural things and to the earth here. This, these gifts of the Spirit are gifts of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost himself. And these are gifts to the body, to the living body of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're dealing today, as in our last lesson, uh, with the gift of faith. This can be a bit confusion in that there are many kinds of faith. This is a special gift of faith where God supernaturally does something for you and not through you. And if you keep that in mind, it'll make it very, very simple. Today's lesson on page 64, number, point number four. It says that the three Hebrew children uh, demonstrated very powerfully this gift of faith. There was no fear in their hearts because fear and faith do not go together. And when you begin to shake and to tremble, that means that faith is not there. Uh, that's your, your trust ended before you got there because uh, faith is trust. How much can you trust God? That is the amount of faith that you possess. These, these three men who banded together as a trio of faith, uh, they were placed in the fiery furnace because of their spiritual life. They had done nothing wrong. They hadn't stolen anything in the palace. They hadn't committed adultery. All the th that they had done wrong was to worship God. And because the king was angry over their worship, he says, I'll put you in the fiery furnace where no one can save you because you do not fall down and worship this image that I have created here. They said, if God can save us, all right. If he don't, it's all right. Now, that's what faith's all about, you know, that you leave things in the hands of God and that God will make it right. Can you say amen? And so they were thrown in the fiery furnace. And before, before they could get into the top of the wood and that they were making the intense heat with, the, the ropes that were around them burned. That because they had no relationship to faith. They didn't belong in that category. The rest of it, their being had to do with their living faith. And suddenly they began to walk up and down. This was an enormous furnace, a place of execution for the king. Uh, and and uh, they began to walk up and down. And there were four walking up and down and not three. And the king was amazed when he says, I see a fourth person, and that fourth person looks like the Son of Man. You could study the word or the phrase Son of Man right straight through the Bible. Jesus called himself the Son of Man uh, uh, 79 times. He, was, he, he uh, identified himself with the problems of mankind. Ezekiel um, uh, was addressed by God as the Son of Man a, a, a number of times. And so uh, it is a remarkable relationship when one comes into a, a situation with God that he represents the hurt, the sorrows, the ups and the downs of mankind. He's not above them. He's not away from them. He's not hidden from them. He is identified with them. The king got so upset because of the fourth man until he said, come out of there. But only three came out. Are you still here? The fourth one went on back to heaven where he came from. And, and I know that was a consternation for the king also when he had to be told that that was the angel of God walking up and down with them. And when they were finished with a little bit of a persecution they had there, uh, then he went on back about his business of doing something else. And they came out and all the nation rejoiced over the amazing salvation. It was a driving force called faith in God that brought these men out of that place. Had they, had they not trusted with all their hearts, it would not have happened. So faith is a trust in God. And an illustration of it are three men who were not afraid of the king, 
nor were they afraid of the persecutions of the king. And your point, and, and your point number five, we bring it from the Bible down into our times. Uh, when I lived in England, several times I went to what is called the George Mueller Orphanage in Bristol, England. Mr. George Mueller demonstrated one of the most amazing lives, not just for a day, lives of remarkable faith of anyone that we have any history of. Uh, when he was quite a young man, without any human effort, now you, you, you have to get this man, without any human effort to raise funds, such as letter writing, he, he wrote no letters for funds, or lecturing, he did not go out lecturing for funds, he fed thousands of orphan children through the gift of faith, which was given him by the Lord, by the Lord uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And they never missed a meal. Thousands of children, they never missed a meal. But he spent much time, most time, in prayer. There were times when they set the table, sang a chorus, and before they could get through, baker trucks came up to all the doors of the orphanage loaded to the top with hot breads for those children to, 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 to enjoy. And all the years that this man was alive, his quiet place, what we used to call closet of prayer, um, was a place where he spent hours and hours and hours, not begging, but communicating, talking to God, God talking to him, you, you open this one and you, you do that and you bring in this many children and you, you, you do that. It was a communication place and not a begging stall. Because we think that faith has to do with begging and begging and begging, but more I think it has to do with praising and praising and praising. Yes. Uh, and, and, and we have to get the right attitude and, and start thanking him for the things that we need. And it works. But uh, his homes are still there. They're not run like they used to be run because he's going to be with the Lord. But, and he, he, he passed away before I got to the country of England. But I could go to his homes, see the little children that are growing up there now, and visit the closet of worship and praise and prayer uh, in which he... It became the dynamo of, of all the millions of pounds. Uh, pound is like your dollar. Uh, millions of dollars that came through there to bless the little children. He is one of the most remarkable, and I imagine we got a book in the bookstore on George Miller. And if not, we can certainly get you one because his, uh, his life story is certainly exciting of what God did. But now, <clears throat> as to our day, because you don't want to go back into history too far, Reverend Howard Carter, London, England, had one of the most remarkable gifts of faith that I have found in, in, anywhere. And I have met so many thousands of people. Now, in this illustration of it here, which is very interesting, there was a group of people and, and they, they pled poverty. You know, they said, we, we're poor. We'll always have to rent a room. We will never have a church building. We are so poor. And he stood up and says, well, uh, where would you like? They says, there's a church building for sale over here, but we have no money. He says, I'll pay for it. Go ahead and worship there. So he went and signed the papers asking for, I think it was 60 days to pay for the building in full. And, and, uh, and everybody was happy. The church group was happy. Now they had a building and a man who owned a Bible college and was the general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, uh, he said he would pay for it completely. Now, you have to understand the inside of this in order to in, in really in, in enjoy it. He signed those papers that within 60 days he would pay for it. Now, he had a Bible college about a, a mile away from this church, and the Bible college students, as they would like to worship over there too, and so it became a kind of a mixture between the local people and the Bible college. After he had been a, a, a week or two uh, from the time he signed it, the Bible college students, who are always an interesting class of people, uh, they said, how much are the 
money do you have? I think it was 30,000 pounds. You multiply that by five and you'll see about how much money he had. The pound in that day was worth five American dollars. And so he said, none of it. But they said, but two weeks ago, and surely you should have some of it. He said, no, I don't have any of it. And said, don't worry about it. The Lord will take care of it. They said, how? Well, he said, I didn't ask the Lord that. And how he takes care of it is not my business. It's his business. Two more weeks passed by and things were getting serious now. You see, he had six weeks and four were gone. And so now the faculty, the, not only the students, the faculty came and said, uh, 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 how, how about the money for this building? How much of it do you have? Well, he said, none of it. He says, I don't need it yet. And they said, but you should have some of it. Over half the time's gone. Surely you should have half of it. Oh, he says, no, I don't have any of it. But I said, don't worry. The Lord will take care of it. The Lord said to give the people a building and we're going to do just that. Another week passed by. Well, they only had one more week now. And the students got so emotional into this, they began to fast and pray. Most fasting and praying is an unbelief. You don't, you don't believe it's going to be done anyway. And so you try to do something about it, you know, on your own. And, and then they got to where they wouldn't eat, you know, at the school. And Brother Carter sometimes would be eating by himself, enjoying a good meal. And they'd say, well, why don't you fast? He said, well, why should I fast? The Lord said he would give the money. Uh, you don't have to keep knocking on his door and screaming at him. And then the next week passed and everybody got sick in the school, you know. None faith can make you sick, you know. Uh, and so they would wring their hands and say, my God, looks like we've got a liar here for, for a professor who owns a school. He's going to buy a church, going to give it to them free, and he don't have a dime. What, what are we going to do with such a man? And, and so they would hardly speak to him. If they did come for food, they'd sit with their head down and eat. And he'd sit at the end of the table smiling because he knew it would come, but they didn't know that, you see. It came down to the last day. The next day, he had to pay for that thing. So they came down to dinner that night, and uh, it was, a, it was a, a very strange dinner. One of the faculty spoke up and says, uh, they called each other Mr. over there. Says, Mr. Carter, do you have the money? You have to pay it tomorrow at 11 o'clock. He says, no. He said, do you have any of it? No, but I don't need it tonight. They said, but you should have some now. He said, God didn't say that. You said it. And, and so there he sat with his student body all against him. If you have real faith in God, that's what will happen to you too. And, and, and he, had, he had all of his faculty against him. And he sat there enjoying his meal, smiling, talking about the weather and a few other things that don't mean anything. And, and, and so he went to his room. I, when I lived there, I occupied that room. And so I, I, I know that room where so much faith was put together and operated on. And in, in England in those days, I presume they still do, uh, they have five deliveries of mail in a day. Your mail will be delivered to you at six o'clock in the morning and it'll be delivered to you maybe by nine o'clock in the morning. And the last mail is about nine o'clock at night that's delivered into your door there. And, and so... Uh, it was about nine o'clock at night and he walked out to get the mail, looked in there and picked it up. Didn't look important, so he put it up on a shelf. He went to undress and to go to bed and the Lord spoke to him and said, did you look at your mail? Well, he said, no, no, not too well. What do you mean? Well, he says, there's a big brown envelope there. Yeah, he says, it got wet too. It was raining today and it got wet. And it'll dry off. He, he, he put on his pajamas and started to bed and the Lord said, there's a big brown envelope up there. He said, yeah, I know that. I'll look at it tomorrow. So some woman sent me a lot of newspaper clippings and I get tired of it anyway. And so he, he rolled over to go to sleep and the Lord says, there's a big brown envelope up there. Well, he says, if it'll please you, I'll open it too. So he got up and tore the end of it open. And it was a big note. They call their dollar bills notes over there. And he, he pulled the thing out. He said, look, there. 
He reached his hand down and got them all out. And he had that many of them. And he began to flip through them. You ever flip through money? It's interesting if you have any. <laughs> he began to count it. Just exactly the amount for that building was in that envelope. Now, now I know what you'd have done. You'd say, whoo, 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 you know. You know what that guy said? He counted it all. He said, only just. None left over for him to, even to ride the streetcar with. He says, only just. You know what the Lord said? That's just all you asked for. <laughs> he should have said, God, give me enough for the building. And if you don't mind, drop in 10 pounds extra. I'd like to go shopping. It would have worked as well as the other worked. You see. He went on to sleep. There was no address on that, no return address on that big brown envelope. It had rained and smeared and he couldn't tell anything about the thing except his name was on the front and the school address. The next morning he went down to breakfast and he laid that big brown envelope by his plate there and says, uh, pass the porridge, that's oatmeal. And, and uh, and he was putting pottage in his plate and putting some sugar or something on top of it. And the glumness of those teachers. Now, if you've got faith, those around you can be as glum as glum, you know? And, and, uh, and, and the students. Nobody was asking for food. Now, if they had studied his personality like I did, when I first met him, I was 20 years old. I began to study the man. I discovered that if you saw him and he was moving his finger like that, he was happy. So I'd, I'd keep studying that finger, you know? I, I, I knew when something was flowing, either in the Word of God or something other, he was moving that finger. But you see, those people were so dumb, even though they were in his school, they hadn't studied anything yet. They didn't understand the man yet. Very few people do understand a man of faith, you see. But on top of the envelope, had his hand, and his finger was going up and down, you see. They didn't know what it's all about. And finally, one, one of the professors uh, says, uh, <clears throat> are you ready to, to, to take care of the business today? He said, yes. Everybody raised their head, you know. He said, are you ready to pay all of it? Uh, yes. Did I hear you say last night that you did not have the money? No, I didn't have it. Did I hear you say that you got it now? Uh, yes. How did you get it? Well, he says, like I get everything else in the mailbox. <laughs> so show it to us. The old Thomas spirit, you know. Show it to us. He reached there and pulled out more money than any of them had ever seen in their lives at one time and passed it around. You know, money smells good when it's new. <laughs> it's you that defile it and make it stink. So he passed it around. And they all had a little flip, you know. Bible school students don't get any money. They like to flip somebody else's money, you see. And they says, well, how did it happen? He said, well, there's the envelope. There's no return address on it. There's no name of anybody on it. We just know, I just know that God sent it. I don't have to know the, the name of the delivery boy. I know the name of Jehovah. He sent it. And he used any, any delivery boy you wanted to. And at 11 o'clock, he went down, paid the full amount for the church. You say, what did it do? It didn't do anything at all for those people around him. They were saying, you think it'll ever work again? That's your spirit of unbelief, you see. Will it ever work again? Brother, if you've got an orange tree, it's not going to stop bearing oranges. If you've got an apple tree, it's not going to stop bearing apples. But unbelief says it will. Unbelief says that's just an accident. It won't ever happen again. Well, that means that for you it won't. But if you had faith, it would. Can you say amen? So we came to know a man with amazing faith. Now, if you look at B in that, it's more amazing than that. Howard Carter 
was in jail and prison. World War I was on, and they asked him to put on a uniform and, and, and go and kill some Germans. Oh, he says, I don't want to do that. He says, you know, I, wanna, I was an Episcopalian, and I got the Holy Ghost, and I speak in tongues. And, and I'm a sergeant, don't, sergeant, don't know what you're talking about. And he says, I'm studying on the gifts of the Spirit, and says, I don't have time. You don't tell the military you don't have time, or they'll give you time, you know. They said, well, if you don't go and fight, we'll put you in prison and make you peel potatoes all during the war. We don't care how long it lasts. He peeled tons and tons of potatoes before they had an automatic potato peeler. His fingers were the potato peelers. And they made him work eight and 10 hours a day peeling potatoes for the rest of the army there, you see. But when he had time off, he was studying the gifts of the Spirit. He was on a very small enclosure with his cot. He was in jail. And through the bombing, bombs falling outside, it opened up the concrete at the top and it began to leak badly on him. Had his little metal cot, he couldn't move it. It was attached to the wall. And he'd move this way and he'd move that way and he still got rained on. He says, this is gonna drive me crazy. All night long, bang, 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 water. And he says, God, why don't you stop that water? And he said, God spoke back and said, stop it yourself. <laughs> he said, now tell me how I can stop it. He said, talk to it. Now to a man that's trying to grow in God, that's pretty heavy, you know. But he said, I'll obey God. It took a little time for him to, you know, to... <laughs> Make up his mind to start. <laughs> That's what faith's all about. How quick can you start, you see? And finally he says, uh, uh, water, go back. And from the tip of his nose to the ceiling, it went, gravitation ceased and it went back the other way. He saw it go right straight back up through the ceiling and for the rest of the war, never a drop of water ever came through those cracks. Yeah. If I've ever met an honest person on the face of the earth, Mr. Howard Carter would be that person. I lived with him for all those years. I never heard him one time even exaggerate. He would underestimate. You know, I'm an evangelist. I said, 50 got saved. He says, I counted them. There were only 48. <laughs> I said, what's the difference of 40 and 50? He said, two. <laughs> he was Mr. Precise. All the time that I knew him, 49 was never 50. It was always 49. So I know that this man was giving us the precise truth because I knew him and knew him better than any other person. I was the only one that ever slept in his room with him for years and years, you see. I, and so we know that he understood what a gift for us, a gift of faith. And, and so... Uh, and number seven, it says, the gift of faith is unlimited. Now that, that's a good one. The gift of faith has been mentioned by many of God's children. It is evidenced when a supernatural event occurs with no human effort related to it. Faith permits God to perform. This, is, this gift is absolutely unlimited because God is the source of the energy and it is impossible to give more than God has. His resources cannot be limited by any human thinking or any human measurements. And, and so you're moving, you're moving into the great resources of God. Like God told me one time in this city here regarding Brother Or Roberts. He says, if you live says there are two barrels, and if you live in your barrel, you're going to scratch the bottom all the time. But says if you live in my barrel, it doesn't have any bottom. Amen. Brother Roberts can get a million dollars, and I can get a million too. You see? Because in him, there is no bottom. Ain't no top either. And so it's up to us what we can receive from God. Not up to God. It is up to us what we receive from God. So let our faith, 
Now, this is a gift of the Spirit. Many people have faith. They have all kinds of faith. There are many kinds of faith. We talked in that in our last lesson. But we're talking about a gift that comes from God that functions through a person in a miraculous way, and they do nothing. He did not get excited and run down to a bank and say, now, if this don't come in, can I back, can you back me on this 30,000 pound, multiply it by five for dollars for this church building? He did not look for any other security. He did not look for it. He knew that he knew. You see, but he's getting down to the deadline. But he had another interpretation. He says, I don't need it until that day at 11 o'clock in the morning. Why be bothered with the stuff when you don't need it? Are you here? Give the Lord a hand, everybody.